Okay, good evening everyone. Thanks for joining me again. You're all very welcome and I hope you're all doing well. This evening I want to cover something that I've wanted to cover for a while, and been meaning to cover for a while, and that is how religions are taught in schools. When I wrote Beyond Terror, I looked into this, and particularly in the secular United States, and this is a west-wide problem, a west-wide issue, including in secular America, where it's unlawful to preach religion in public schools, or it used to be. There is definite, and I think I'll, I'll, I'll try and show you some of this tonight, there is definite bias, and there is definite preaching of religion in American schools and in ours. Um, and it's a shift for America. And it's become a really controversial issue there. There are religions that are taught differently to other religions. And this is what I'm going to discuss. It's a bias in favour of and a bias against. And if you can't guess, it's a bias in favour of this one and against this one. And it is, of course, because, as we know, the education system is dominated by the left all over the West. And this is an attack on, on Western, Western, the West, generally. This is the majority religion, the traditional, for the last couple of thousand years at least, traditional heritage religion of the West. And that's why the education system is biased against it. This, of course, as we know, is a innocent, helpless victim at all times and everywhere, including in our classrooms. So I've had a read through. This is a curriculum book for Key Stage 3, which is 11 to 14 year olds. Um, this is the teaching of these two religions, the curriculum teaching of these two religions. And... I read these, I read them just today, so they're fresh in my mind and, and my thoughts on them are fresh in my mind. And I read them in the, with the awareness of the fact that I may, given my, given, well, given what I do and my history and I may be biased in this. I may find things that I'm putting there rather than that are there. So with my own potential bias in mind, I looked at these and I'm confident and comfortable to say I've looked at them as objectively as I can. And I've questioned myself on whether or not they are as different as I think they are. And I've concluded that, yes, objectively, they are completely, completely different in their approach. And I will show you the key reasons why. So we'll start with Islam. And this book, well, it's from 2017, so it's three years old. And I've noted a few key passages in the teaching. And I'll show you how different it is from... Well, the, the overall book is completely different between the two. But the this book, the Islam book, it veers into praise, I would say, of Islam and certainly praise of Muhammad. This book veers into criticism of Christianity and scarcely, bizarrely, scarcely mentions Jesus. Whereas Muhammad in here is matter-of-factly praised. So let's start with the beginnings of Islam. Islam was founded after the other Abrahamic religions, in brackets, Judaism and Christianity, but Muslims often refer to Jews and Christians as people of the book. This is because Muslims believe that God, Allah in Arabic, revealed himself to earlier prophets mentioned in the Bible, such as Abraham, Moses and Jesus. However, Muslims believe that over time the message of these prophets was changed and corrupted. And so God sent one final prophet, Muhammad. Now, immediately to me, and again, and if you, I mean, do the same yourselves. Take my potential bias into account here. I'm trying to be as objective as I can. But to me, there's a hint of that Muslims are kind to Jews and Christians immediately. That Muslims have respect 
for Jews and Christians immediately. It immediately, in the first sentence, tells you that Muslims refer to Jews and Christians as people of the book. Um, goes on to tell us that there is a final prophet uh, who is Muhammad. It goes on, Muslims believe that God revealed messages, in brackets, revelations to Muhammad about what people should believe and how, sh how they should live their lives. They consider these revelations to be perfect and final. The revelations that were given to Muhammad were memorized by his followers and collected in a book called the Quran after his death. The Quran is written in Arabic, but there are translat translations in English and other languages. Next little sort of fact box. I like these fact box. Did most historians agree that Muhammad was a real person? However, when considering events from hundreds or thousands of years ago, it can be difficult to separate facts and legends. Sometimes writers want to influence the way people are remembered so they may change or exaggerate events. Events. This applies to all of history, not just Islamic history. I mean, that's actually fair enough. But again, there is a discussion of Muhammad here. I'm going to go through Christianity, you'll see the difference. So we go on to how did Islam begin? At the time of Muhammad, there were two main cities in Central Arabia, Mecca and Medina. Uh, Arabian desert. Uh, oh, oh, he Muhammad was raised by his uncle because both of his parents were dead and he was taken across the Arabian desert and where he gained a reputation as an excellent trader. He was given the nickname Al-Amin, which means the trustworthy. At the age of 25, Muhammad married a wealthy businesswoman and widow called Khadija. She was 15 years older than him, but she admired the skills he had learned from his uncle. Once again, there's a lot of praise here for Muhammad. He's very much being elevated by this. Scarcely a mention of Jesus in here. Now, this, this paragraph um, did uh, make, make me smile. If it, in the seventh century, there was much cruelty, violence and poverty in the city of Mecca. Muhammad disliked this and he would often retreat to a cool, quiet cave in the mountains outside in order to think and pray. I mean, they are... They, I, I talk about it's It's always sanctification. It definitely, definitely amounts to praise. It was in this cave at the age of 40 that Muhammad had a religious experience that would change his life and the society of Mecca forever. They go on to talk about this being the night of power where the Quran began to be revealed. Just another noteworthy chapters in, in evidence, if you like, of the praising of Muhammad, the elevation of Muhammad in the National School Curriculum of the UK. And there's a, another little sort of fact box um, called Bilal. One man who was attacked because of his conversion to Islam was a slave called Bilal. He was one of Muhammad's earliest followers. When Bilal's master found out that he had converted to Islam, he violently tortured him. But Bilal would not give up his faith. His master was angry that Bilal regarded God as more important than him and that Bilal would not honour the many idols that other Meccans worship. His master ordered that a large stone be placed on Bilal's chest to slowly crush him. Bilal simply said, Ahad, Ahad, God is one. Muhammad was shocked when he heard about the treatment of Bilal, of Bilal and told his friend Abu Bakr to buy Bilal from his master. After Bilal was freed from slavery, he became, he became a close friend of Muhammad. There is, there are several, this is, this is this, throughout the book, this elevation of Muhammad into this wise and compassionate character who was, who firmly disliked any violence or injustice. In actuality, um, there probably, and I say this as an objective observer, I don't believe in any religion, I don't believe in any uh, philosophy, any ideology completely, I take what I believe in from each and every one of them. Uh, but as an objective observer, actually, that sounds more to me a peaceful um, teacher of, of tolerance and, and uh, of, of a preacher against injustice sounds more to me uh, like Jesus than it does Muhammad. But they're taught 
very, very differently. The next chapter is Muhammad the politician, where they credit him with all this wisdom. Um, I'm not going to read it all, obviously, but there is next a paragraph, a couple of paragraphs, on entitled Muhammad the warrior. Uh, no, actually, I must read you Muhammad the politician, this final part of it. One of the first things that Muhammad did when he arrived in Medina was to write the Constitution of Medina. This was a set of religious laws that aimed to bring together Muslim, Jewish, Christian and polytheist tribes who lived there and create a fairer society. It included rules to help widows and orphans and it said that Medina should be a sacred place where no weapons could be carried. This was Muhammad's first attempt at creating a community based on religious beliefs and Medina became the first Islamic city-state. That is how our curriculum is describing an Islamic city-state, a, a place where Muslim, Jew, Jewish, Christian and polytheist live together and create a fairer society. And that, they are saying, was Muhammad's first political act. It's extraordinary. The next is Muhammad the warrior. At the time of Muhammad, there were many violent disputes between tribes across the Arabian Peninsula. In 624, Muslims in Medina were being persecuted by tribes in Mecca. Muhammad led his armies of followers into battle to defend the safety of Muslims in Medina against this violence. The Battle of Badir, as the event became known, confirmed that Muhammad was no longer just a prophet and a politician. He was also a strong warrior. As a result of his victory in this battle, more people in Medina accepted Muslim or Muhammad's authority. It is quite extraordinary, isn't it? It is, it is, it's almost preaching. Um, it's preaching for Muhammad uh, and preaching for Islam. It is also a complete distortion of what he actually did, which was conquer and brutalize and force submission. He is known it, it, in their own scripture, he was a killer uh, and a, a conqueror. Uh, and the idea that people lived together in an Islamic state and that society became fairer, they lived in an, Islam, in, is, in an Islamic state as dimmies, as servants, as so in, entirely inferior to Muslims. Absolutely extraordinary. If we go on uh, a couple of chapters, there's a chapter here, Why Did Islam Split?, that goes into sort of political, the split between Shia and Sunni. We have a chapter then about the Quran, which describes it, uh, the fact that it is not in chronological order, for example, um, and that uh, women, uh, that uh, people uh, accept it as the complete and final word of God. It talks a little bit about the surah. And it says, each surah is named after an object or a subject within it. For example, surah 2 is called the cow because in it Moses tells people to sacrifice a cow. Surah 29 is called the spider. Surah 35 is called the creator. The most important surah is the first, the opening, which Muslims must recite five times each day. You can read this surah on page 18. I made a little note to that and that's why I just said the word women as I, I saw that. They omitted to include the chapter entitled The Women, in which it tells uh, what men can do to women, including beat them if they are disobedient. I wonder why that little um, ditty didn't come into discussion of how the sorrows are named after the subject within them. We go on to talk about respecting the Quran. Uh, next is what do Muslims believe about God? Um, fairly uncontroversial stuff. They believe he was uh, the one and only. We go on to who are the prophets in Islam. And these are named as Abraham or Ibrahim, Jesus or Isa, uh, Muhammad. Now, the part of Jesus, uh, again, it's praising of Islam. It's putting Islam in a very, very favorable light. It opens with Jesus is viewed with great respect by Muslims and is an important prophet. And we're told this over and over again. And it's meant to be some sort of interfaith unity. Uh, but actually, of course, what it teaches is completely antithetical to the message of Christianity. It reduces 
Jesus to uh, one of many prophets and completely defies and denies the central message of Christianity. Uh, and I think it's worth keeping that in mind. I'm not trying to stir up trouble. I just think it's it's worth keeping that in mind. And that, of course, isn't stated here. It's all very positive towards Islam and Islam is very, very positive towards other religions. And that is the prevailing message throughout this. It also, there's a key facts section. These are not just facts, but key facts section at the end of the book. And this tells us that Islam is the second largest and fastest growing religion in the world. I hear this quite a lot, that it's the fastest growing religion in the world. Um, I've yet to be presented with any co concrete evidence and clear evidence that that is the case. But it is stated as a fact, as a key fact here. And again, it doesn't offer any evidence that that's the case. Another key fact, Muhammad was a religious and political leader, uh, as well as a warrior who ruled over Medina and then Mecca. He fought against persecution of early Muslims and by the end of his life was the most influential, influel, influential man in the Arabian Peninsula. It's, um, it's quite, quite extraordinary again how how this amounts to praise and it's praise generally i mean look at this one it stood out to me there's a picture of a mosque and it says underneath very matter of factly some of the most architecturally impressive buildings in the world are mosques we go on to eid eid al fatur is mentioned what isn't mentioned is the horrific uh, bloodbath um that comes with it, funnily enough. Another one that stands out, and this is one of those little boxes again, a sort of a fact box. Sharia law, this one is entitled. Sharia law teaches Muslims what is halal. Halal is an Arabic word meaning permitted. The word is most often heard when describing food, but it can also be used to describe prayer, fasting, clothes, or other things. Any object or action can be halal. The opposite of halal is haram, which means unlawful or forbidden. Any meat that Muslims eat must be halal. For meat to be halal, the animal needs to be killed by cutting the jugular vein, carotid artery and windpipe with a sharp knife. All blood is then drained from the animal. During this process, an Islamic message is recited. Muslims believe that eating pork and drinking alcohol is always haram. Um, it doesn't tell you here that under Sharia law, uh, the word of a woman is worth half of a man's. It doesn't tell you that under Sharia law, the word of a non-Muslim is worth half of a Muslim's. It doesn't tell you uh, that a man is permitted to beat his wife under Sharia law. It doesn't tell you quite a few uh, things about Sharia law and that it is practiced contrary to what is lawful in this country. It is practiced in this country. It doesn't tell you that people are forced into it. It doesn't tell you uh, it doesn't tell you quite a bit, nor does it tell you about halal slaughter, that the animal is conscious throughout and can take minutes to die, and that almost every animal welfare group in the Western world is opposed to it on the grounds that it causes completely unnecessary and what amounts to torturous suffering for the animal during the process of slaughter. It doesn't mention any of that, and it doesn't mention also that in the matter of slaughter there is an alternative which renders the animal unconscious prior to slaughter and that Muslims refuse to participate in it. We do have a section now, what should women wear? The Quran teaches that both men and women should dress modestly. This is interpreted different ways by different Muslims. In many ways, that's a, a, a statement of fact, uh, but it doesn't quite tell the whole story. Um, the Quran does say that men and women should both be modest, but it also says that women who are not veiled um, are rather legitimately harassed. And therefore that women, the message in that is that women should veil to avoid being harassed. Um, and it's quite clear. It goes on to say some believe it means that someone, that women should wear a hijab. Uh, some means a, some think it means a niqab. Some think it means a burqa. It does go on to say that there are disputes about whether or not this thing should be banned. It gives a fairly standoffish message. But it does do this thing that I, I'm, I'm always really alert to. Some people would argue 
and then it goes on to argue itself. If you if you if you see the distinction, let me give you an example. This is a, a paragraph on arguments for banning coverings. It says sometimes the media have used images of women wearing a niqab when reporting on acts of terrorism carried out by other people claiming to be Muslims. Some newspapers have done this when the act was not carried out by people wearing any covering. This sort of treatment of Islam may make people like the idea, link the idea of coverings one, one's body with terrorism. So they feel threatened by it. That is taking the side in the argument. It is. It's subtle, but it's there. They will say things like some people like to argue that wearing a covering like the niqab stops Muslim women from integrating into European societies. OK, but why don't we have, for example, the ruling on the European Court of Human Rights that agreed with this, that said it did stop integration and that agreed with France uh, for banning it on and agreed on those grounds. There's a completely one sided message and the book is taking a side and language like this sort of treatment of Islam. It's taking a side. We go on to talk about Islam. What is jihad? We talk a little bit about lesser jihad, which it claims is the includes militant jihad I'll, I'll read a, a part of it to you the arabic word jihad literally means to struggle and can refer to a f physical or spiritual struggle lesser jihad in the years following the night of power muhammad and his followers were persecuted because of their monotheistic message again muslims are victims and have been persecuted and Muslim and Muhammad was a great warrior for responding to this persecution and it's written it really is written throughout this leads to Islamic militancy today the majority and this is a statement of fact as well and I'll compare this to something it says about Christians in a moment the majority of people today believe that people should be free to choose their religion or no religion rather than having a particular religion forced upon them that's a statement of fact I want evidence that that is true among Muslims they do say the majority of people today but they imply that it's the majority of Muslims at least to me they do and in context of the whole book it certainly sings that to me it goes on to say the majority of Muslims also believe that using violence to spread Islam is unacceptable okay I can I can perhaps accept this but pay attention to the language the majority of Muslims also believe that using violence is unacceptable I'll compare that to Christianity in just a few minutes it goes on to say in a separate paragraph after mentioning <coughs> after mentioning 9-11 it goes on to say the vast majority of Muslims are appalled by the actions of these groups and reject both their violent interpretation of the Quran and also their attitude towards people of different religions. <sighs> Again, these are statements of fact without any real evidence backing them up, but more importantly to me is the language that is used. Now, I'm going to go, this is essentially the end of this book. So I want to pick up with Christianity where I leave off with Islam here. But before I do, we do have, we have a picture of Sadiq Khan looking very masterful and very powerful in the Islam in Britain chapter uh, with the uh, caption underneath, in 2016, Londoners voted for Sadiq Khan to be the first Muslim mayor of London. We talk about modern challenges and what is the first thing mentioned under modern challenges in Britain with Islam today? It is, of course, you've guessed it, Islamophobia. Many Muslims living in mainly Christian or secular societies have experienced rising levels of Islamophobia, matter of fact. This situation has worsened in recent years because of other terrorist attacks beyond 9-11. Some people argue that poor reporting of Islam in the media, there's another example of some people argue when actually the text is arguing it, 
uh, but pretending it's someone else. Some people argue that poor reporting of Islam in the media has further encouraged negative stereotypes and discrimination. It's the text that is telling you this as a matter of fact, but to avoid looking like it's doing so, it's placing the, some people argue, in front of it. Always pay attention to this language. They say, the some people who argue it, it is unfair to judge the majority of peace-loving Muslims on the violent actions of a small group and that these militants' actions are against the message of Islam. They say that. The textbook's not saying that, of course not. That would be bias. They say that. We have a little caption book uh, section here then on Islamophobia. They do acknowledge that it's a new word that has entered the English language. Phobia means either a fear or dislike of something. Islamophobia describes the way in which some people dislike, discriminate and are prejudiced against Muslims because of their religion. In recent years, there has been an increase in Islamophobic crime in Britain. Like what? Where? This can involve verbal, physical or online abuse of Muslims. So it is stating that this is a crime, and they're probably right actually, but they're backing up the idea that online abuse of Muslims is a crime. It does go on to acknowledge that some people dislike the word Islamophobia. This is an afterthought and argue that it may prevent people from making fair criticisms of Islam. It's true. It does. For example, if someone says that it is wrong for women to be made to wear headscarves in conservative Islamic countries, women are made to wear headscarves, and that's not conservatism, that's slavery. Um, in Islamic countries, he or she, if you object to this, he or she may be accused of being Islamophobic. We are accused of being Islamophobic. However, critics say that in free societies, all religions and beliefs should be debated and that criticising a religion is not the same as making generalisations about whole groups of people. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they sort of have to do that, don't they, as an afterthought, uh, take into account the other side of the argument. But they don't take its side in the way that they take the matter of fact uh, crimes against Muslims are awful and appalling and online abuse is appalling and something must be done. They are, they are absolutely taking a side there. Okay, so that really brings me to the end of the Muslim book. So now I want to go on to the Christian one. And where are we for time? 27 minutes, okay. Now I want to go on to the Christian one. And I want to pick up where I left off with the majority of Muslims also believe that using violence to spread Islam is unacceptable. So let me go to Christianity. Okay. Under the chapter... The Crusades, of course. Let me just repeat to you what it says in the book <clears throat> about Islamic militancy today. It says, pay attention to the language. The majority of Muslims also believe that using violence to spread Islam is unacceptable. The vast majority of Muslims are appalled by the actions of these groups, terrorist groups, and reject both their violent interpretation of the Quran and also their attitude towards people of different religions. Very, very strong, very matter of fact. Now let's see what it says about Christians. Although most Christians today believe that violence should be a last resort, this has not always been the case. Do you see the difference? It's not me, right? It's not my bias. I'm not seeing what I'm putting there. That is starkly, starkly different in tone, in attitude, and in, and in matter-of-factness. Again, the majority of Muslims also believe that using violence to spread Islam is unacceptable. Although most Christians today believe violence should be a last resort, this has not always been the case. You must see the difference between the, in, in the approach. That, to me, alone, it's obviously not enough evidence, but it is stark evidence to show a completely different approach to the attitude towards the two religions. To, as an overall feel, 
and I won't go through this in as much detail as I did that one, uh, frankly, because there's not as much to say, and I'll explain why. There's not as much to compare. I can't make fair comparisons, and the reason being that this is a completely different book. Jesus isn't really mentioned in here, and that's what I find so extraordinary about it. Muhammad, the individual, is roundly praised over and over again in the teaching of Islam. It amounts to preaching to my mind. It amounts to extolling the virtue of Islam to my mind. And I think many of you will agree. And I think you'll agree that it isn't a matter of bias, that it's objectively uh, observable, the, and a stark difference in how the two religions are approached. And just with that, those two sentences, I think there's a stark difference. But the books themselves are entirely, entirely different. There's a completely different vibe about this one. It is very much a historical document, this one. And I'll give you an idea of what I mean. While Islam talks about, the book about Islam talks about Christ, or about Muhammad, I think I need more coffee. Actually, that's not a bad idea. All right, that's better. While the Islam book talks about Muhammad and talks about the positive aspect, aspects of his of what he taught, actually lies about the positive aspect of who he was and what he taught and what he brought to the world, there's scarcely, there's no recognition really of Jesus in here and what he taught and what he brought to the world. It's very much about the churches and about the history of the churches and about war between the churches and the general message of it is that Christianity has a history of war and violence and bloodshed and uh, it's it's extremely, extremely critical, actually. Um, so let me start with where did Christianity begin? It says Christianity began nearly 2000 years ago in present day Israel, which was then part of the Roman Empire. I may be a little bit paranoid on this one. I'll give you that. I, I may. This may be me, but to me... <laughs> What it's doing there is is de-westernising. There's a, there's a hint of de-westernisation of Christianity in there. Anyway, that may be a little bit. <laughs> I may be over-egging the pudding a little bit on that one. However, it goes on to say, the first Christians had radical new beliefs. They claimed that a recently executed Jewish man named Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah. I think that's rather... Um, uh, how do I put it? It sounds a little bit like a, a mockery. And I don't know why they have they repeatedly refer to Jesus as a Jewish man, which sounds a little bit... Again, I may be over-egging it a little bit here. And perhaps, I may I, I admit, I may be guilty of spotting things here that may not be there. But tell me whether you agree or not. They repeatedly refer to him as a Jewish man, which I find quite... He was, but I find quite odd how often they say it. I don't know whether this is trying to be an interfaith thing, but it does smack a little bit of propaganda of some sort to me. I'm not entirely sure what, but it does appear strange to me. They believe that three days after being killed on a wooden cross, Jesus had been resurrected. He appeared to many people before ascending to heaven. Christians claim that Jesus had died so that people who believed in him could be forgiven for their sins and have eternal life. These were extraordinary claims. That's the second time they've said that. They don't say that Muhammad going to the cave and getting a message from Gabriel. And they actually put in there that he, was, he wasn't he was able to read, but the angel Gabriel put his hands around his waist and forced to read. And they don't say that these were extraordinary claims. Uh, twice in sh quick succession. Am I seeing this? Am I, put, am I being paranoid here? Or do you see it as well? There's, a, there's an air of almost mockery of Christianity here and I don't know whether there's I don't know why I've referred to 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 um to Jesus as Jewish as well because he was but it's I don't know what this is there's something very odd about this it goes on to say Christians are monotheist which means that they believe in one God however Christians also believe that God is three this distinctive belief that God is both one and three is called the Trinity. The three persons of the Trinity are God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The doctrine of the Trinity is an attempt to express how Christians understand God, 
For 2,000 years, Christians have tried to understand how it is possible for one God to be Father, Son and Holy Spirit at the same time. Does everyone see this? I, they're stating, what they're saying is, 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 I guess, true. But there's a language here that is entirely different to the language used to describe Islam. Christians are united by their faith in Jesus, but there is no such thing as a typical Christian. Over the past 200 years, there have been many disagreements between Christians, and sometimes those have led to new types of Christianity. Today, there are over 30,000 denominations of Christianity. The largest of these is the Catholic Church. Again, it's all very, um, there's certainly no praise. It's all very, um, almost as if, well, we've got to tell you this, so we may as well just get it over with. I don't know what it is. I, I hope you can agree or, or at least see what I'm saying. I can't quite put my finger on what it is. It's dismissive. It's, it's yes, it veers into mockery to me. Um, it's certainly not anything like the approach to Islam. Next chapter is how did Christianity begin? Um, again, it's all very ob objective, dispassionate, historic recording, if you like. He, they refer to Jesus again several times um, as Jewish, which, I, which I, again, I have no problem with. I, I, I get, as I say, it was, it's true. It just, I don't think I've seen that much. Um, Next chapter, what was life like for the early church? So again, it's very much a histor almost a historic. Again, Jesus or his teachings are not mentioned in this. It's about conflict. It's largely the entire book is about conflict between different parts of Christianity. Either ideological conflict or military conflict. It very much... Uh, very much a standoffish, critical, I will go as far as to say, as to say critical. Um, in fact, I'll go as far as to say very critical. But we go on to the next one, Constantine and the Council of Nicaea. Again, nothing about Jesus in here, um, except from a very the politics of the time, a historical record of the politics of the time. That's it. That's it. I've been searching for those words for the last few minutes. That's it. It's a, it's a historic documentation of the political and social elements of the time. That's what it is. So next part is the Great Schism and the Catholic Church. And again, there appears to be what, what is to me almost a mockery of Christian beliefs. Um, contained throughout this but at, at best dismissive as absurd or ridiculous at worst mockery whereas uh, nothing of the kind appears uh, in Islam even when discussing the sort of more outlandish aspects of Islamic belief we go on then to who is the Pope the Reformation and the Salvation Army Quakers and the Amish, all very descriptive uh, uh, records of various different types of Christians, uh, historical, Martin Luther and the Reformation, the Reformation, the Church of England, um, the Amish, the Quakers, what else have we got? Christianity and the modern world, what is the Bible? Very, even in here, even in here, there is essentially nothing about Jesus or what he taught. And for the record, I very much admire and accept and even practice and believe in a lot of what Jesus taught. Um, I believe in a lot of what Buddha taught as well and many others, but he's not, his teachings are not mentioned in here. Now, here's an interesting chapter. Is Britain a Christian country? Christianity has been an important part of British life for over 1400 years, but in recent decades, belief has changed, raising the question of whether it is right to call Britain a Christian country. 
So again, there's a, an immediate, and in the first, this isn't even the first paragraph, it's the heading. So we have that calling into question of and, and highlight highlighting a demise in Christianity. Whereas in the Islam book, it, gro it goes to great pains to show the growth of Islam and the expansion of Islam and how many people convert to Islam and have converted to Islam over the years. Here, it opens by telling us that there is a decline in Christianity. How did Christianity reach Britain? Uh, Britain was the westernmost point. Again, it's a, it's a historical record. It may as well be a history book, whereas that may as well be a pro-Islam propaganda book. Christianity's impact and influence. Christianity is still an influen influential part of British life. This can be seen in the no number of churches across the country and in the education system, where 30% of children attend a Christian faith school. When someone becomes king or queen, he or she also becomes head of the Church of England and is given the title Defender of the Faith. The national anthem refers to God three times and two of the main holiday periods in Britain, Christmas and Easter, are Christian festivals. Uh, we have then follow-up chapters about um, how Britain has become more secular and religiously diverse about some debate between Christians on public life. We have one here about uh, secularism and public life, prayer and publicity. It talks about a uh, controversy back in 2015 when a cinema refused to show an advert for a Christian, a pro-Christian advert. Uh, and was accused of limiting free speech, including by the Equality and Human Rights Commission. And for the record, I think they were limiting free speech. But again, what I can only describe as a standoffish attitude throughout, when it's not standoffish, when it does, when it is guilty of bias, and it is, it is hugely uh, critical. Uh, to my mind, it, some people may find it somewhat critical. Uh, to my mind, it's... As we go on, it gets more and more critical. Now, here's perhaps the most critical aspect of it. Slavery and the Crusades. There's no chapter in here about slavery and the Quran. There is no chapter in there about wife beating and the Quran. There is no chapter in there about killing apostates and the Quran. No chapter about Muhammad at slaughtering, at people, at cutting the heads off people nothing of the kind but in here when we have no mention of Jesus so far I kid you not of course there is mention of him in historic terms as a character in the Bible when they're discussing the Bible there is no praise for him there is no mention of his teachings there is no he's scarcely in here at all while we have no mention of slavery and Muhammad in that book we have a headline, Slavery and the Crusades, in this one. I'll read a great chunk of this. Again, pay attention to the vibe, the attitude, the wording, the overall feel of this. Slavery is the heading. Between the 17th and 19th century, white Europeans and Americans captured black Africans and transported them to the USA in terrible conditions. Many Africans died on the slave ships. Those that survived were sold to wealthy white Christians and forced to work for them. Some slave owners tried to justify slavery by saying that in Paul's letters in the Bible, he refers to slaves and masters, showing he accepted slavery. No mention of slavery in Islam or in the Quran, in the coverage the curriculum of Islam. However, other Christians thought that keeping people as slaves was against the Bible's teachings about equality and the sanctity of life. Christians led campaigns to abolish slavery in, Britain, in many countries, including the USA and Britain. After slavery was abolished, racism remained a problem. Christian leaders, such as Martin Luther King, used Bible teachings to argue that racism is wrong. King encouraged his supporters to peacefully protest against racism 
and to follow Jesus' teachings to love and pray for their enemies. That may be the only time that Jesus' teachings are referred to and certainly the only time that they're referred to positively, um, but in fact the only time they're referred to. But pay attention to the language. First of all, we are this it, to teach this, and I've little doubt this is three years ago, okay, but I've little doubt that it's changed in the meantime. It's probably actually, I suspect next year's curriculum they will ramp it up a bit and we'll have a little bit of Black Lives Matter in there. I'm not saying this didn't happen, it did happen. But if we're going to talk about slavery, let's talk about slavery. There should be a chapter on slavery in there. There should be a the recognition of the fact that white people are not the only ones ever to keep slaves. This is here, and white is mentioned a couple of times as the slave owners, white and European. We, if we're going to talk about slavery, why are we only talking about it in this context? And it is the only way we talk about it. And it's the only way Black Lives Matter talk about it. And this is Black Lives Matter ideology right here. Yes, it happened. And yes, it was wrong. And yes, we should talk about it. But we need to talk about slavery in the round if we're going to talk about slavery. To talk about it in one context only is to attack one group of people. Guess who? And, and, and I love the way it, it states, after slavery was abolished. As if that was some sort of thing that just happened. It was abolished. Actually, sorry, uh, school curriculum, but it was abolished by the same white people that you've just... Uh, dismissed as as uh, as evil in the last paragraph so we go on to the crusades on the next page and this is where we get the um, although most christians today believe that violence should be a last resort this has not always been the case whereas muslims they uh, the vast vast majority of them think violence is completely unacceptable and are appalled by it most Christians think violence is a last resort, but they haven't always been like that. This is what we get. In the 11th to... 11th... I do need more coffee. In the 11th to 13th... Although, to be fair, that's not easy to say. Centuries, Christians fought in wars known as the Crusades. In 1079, a powerful group of Muslims conquered Jerusalem. Christians were concerned that these Muslims, ru Muslim rulers might ban them from visiting the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. This was a popular pilgrimage site for Christians because they believed it was where Jesus was resurrected. Christians were also worried that Islam was expanding into the Christian city of Constantinople. Christian city, by the way, is in quote marks. OK, there's a couple more paragraphs, but let's look at this one first. We're, we've, we've covered the most Christians believe violence is a last resort thing. In 1079, a powerful group, powerful group of Muslims conquered Jerusalem. Yes, that will be Muslims conquering in the name of Allah, which they did and have done for centuries. Christians were concerned that these Muslim rulers might ban them from visiting the church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. No, Christians knew that Muslims were conquering the world and subjugating all non-Muslims as dhimmis. That's what they knew. And they were concerned only because this was a popular pilgrimage site for Christians. They weren't concerned at all about the murder and the subjugation. It goes on. In 1095, Pope Urban II called for an army of soldiers of Christ to march across Europe as part of what became known as the First Crusade. It was, its aim was to defend Constantinople and conquer Jerusalem. No, it was to defend both. The Pope promised that ta those taking part would be forgiven for their past sins and guaranteed a place in heaven. Fair enough, but that's exactly what jihadis are promised too. Approximately 60,000 crusaders began the journey of nearly 5,000 kilometres. To avoid starvation, some of them ate dogs and rats. There were even rumours that they ate human flesh. The crusaders looted many villages and killed a large number of Jews on the journey. Only 15,000 crusaders survived the four-year journey to Jerusalem. Despite their decreased number, they managed to conquer the city. Once inside, the crusaders looted the holy Islamic site known as the Dome of the Rock and mass massacred the Muslim and Jewish population. Many were tortured and burned alive. 
So. Over here. Let's, let's go through it in summary again. Over here. We have a religion founded by a man who is described with great affection throughout, who is elevated throughout, who is described as a great thinker, a compassionate man, a man of wisdom, uh, a great politician and a great warrior who defended his people from oppression. He, his message spread because it was simply such a wonderful message and he united people under his unity and he made for a fairer society. It tells us that the first Islamic society was just that society and is therefore telling children that that's what an Islamic society is where people of all faiths and none live happily together because Islam is so merciful. This is a lie and a complete distortion of reality. It says nothing, nothing at all about the horrors of the teachings of Islam. Nothing. This elevates Islam and its founder and amounts to preaching. It amounts to the propagation of Islam. By absolute stark contrast, this does not mention the founder of this religion, the man on which, on whose teachings this reality, this religion is based and the reality of it. It scarcely mentions him and it does so only to put when discussing, discussing the Bible in a political or historic context. This book focuses very much on conflict within Christianity on the demise of Christianity, the problems with Christianity, and it paints Christianity as an oppressive force, one which used grotesque violence against innocent Muslims. It is a distortion of the truth, of course, but it is also a rewriting of history. And it is very, very obvious and clear that the British school curriculum is propagating for Islam and demonizing Christianity. It's clear from that, and it's clear from much more information that I have gained on this issue through researching it for some years. But just through reading some parts of those two books, I think that is very evident and very clear. Um, you may not agree, you may not agree with some of the points, do let me know uh, in the comments and, um, Let's debate it and discuss it further. It's crucial. It's absolutely key. And it's why I argue that we have to change the school curriculum. I do want people, I do want us to know the truth. I want children taught the truth at appropriate ages when they're able to handle it. But it must be the unvarnished truth. And as I say, one example is slavery. If we're going to talk about slavery, let's talk about slavery, all of it everyone's guilt in it and who abolished it in the west who was it that abolished the slave trade that we are so focused on with black lives matter and what have you today let's talk about that too teach the kids the whole story but this is bias this is propaganda and this is why the school curriculum has to change and that's why it's for britain policy to change the school curriculum Okay, thank you all very much for joining me this evening. I shall see you back on my live stream at half seven on Monday. Thanks again and take care until then.